from the Witwatersrand University left Johannesburg to search for the yellow bushmen of the Okavango swamps. Here Dr. van Hoogstraten, leader of the expedition, studies a map of the overland route to the swamps. From Johannesburg, northward to the Botswana border, to Francistown, and westward to Maun and the Okavango swamps. The members of the team were Dr. Cyril Thomas, a dentist and deputy leader. Bill Corneal, crocodile hunter and skipper of the boats. Clive Chappell, entomologist and dentist. George Beaton, medical scientist. Hamish Hart, senior science student. Ben Grunewald, production assistant of Springbok Radio, in charge of actuality sound recordings made of bushmen and animals in and around the swamps. Dr. Herbert Wong, medical officer of the expedition. Clive Cowley, reporter of the Johannesburg Star and official scribe. Clive made detailed notes in the daily logbook. Fiona Barber, linguist and ethnologist, the only woman on the expedition. Graham Maxwell, senior science student and driver of the five-ton truck. Leslie Erwick, senior science student. Ma Chin, senior science student assigned to make face masks of bushmen in the field. The medical supplies are among the most comprehensive ever taken into the desert. We included surgical instruments, antibiotics, local anesthetics, antisera to treat snake bite from gaboon viper and mamba and from button spider and bottles of dried human blood plasma. Included in the kit is a mechanical respirator and here we are testing it on a perfectly healthy member of the team. This instrument may have to be used in case of ambush by buffalo or some other accident in the field, far from clinics or hospitals. We strike a vast grassland plain on our third day out of Johannesburg. Under this huge baobab, on the edge of the savanna around the mysterious Makari Kari salt pans, we pitched our second camp and started rehearsing some of the vital routines of the expedition. Two hours after sunrise, the vast silence is broken only by the voices of humans, preparing for a journey of about 1,200 miles by boat through swamplands infested with mosquitoes, tsetse flies, scorpions, and spiders. This mosquito net ground sheet combination was especially designed to protect us from such pests. Instruments and supplies are checked. Ben Grunewald and Clive Chappell overhaul Ben's tape recorder. We have no tents. July rain and cloud are unknown in the Okavango, so in our quilted sleeping bags under the mosquito nets, we sleep warmly and comfortably with only the star-studded Botswana night sky for our roof. Clothing and bedding are packed in canvas bags, which would float if the boat should capsize. Our long overland trek is not without incident. Here, our truck sticks fast in the desert sand. Smoke billows as the clutch strains, without effect. Not really a calamity, but a break in the journey through endless leagues of scrub. Here, the front wheels are wedged sideways. A few good heaves, and the truck soon pushes herself free. Matapa Ning, crocodile hunter Bob Wilmot's base camp on the edge of the Okavango swamps. Here we are to leave our vehicles and transfer to boats. Our search for the yellow bushmen in the heart of the swamps is about to begin.
Excitedly, we see our aluminium boats for the first time. They are moored to a jetty with their green sunshades high above the decks, afloat on the clear blue waters of the Thalamakani River. Water lily leaves in profusion. These plants will later help us identify the route taken by the Bushman canoe. As we unload our truck, we find that all our provisions cannot be loaded into the boats. Some portion must go overland to our turning point. Luxuries will have to be left behind. We lose no time in acquainting ourselves with the basic facts about the reptile most feared by the indigenous inhabitants, the crocodile. While we examine the skin of a 14-foot specimen, Mr. Wilmot answers our rush of questions. Crocodile skins are prized in the Western world as material for deluxe articles of clothing and for handbags. Crocodiles are not hunted only for their skins. As we were to learn dramatically later, they are voracious and indiscriminate feeders. And among their victims are humans, goats, leopards, dogs, hyenas, porcupines, warthog. Even a 14-foot python was extracted intact from a dead crocodile's belly. And so, in areas inhabited by humans, they must be regularly cropped. At the base camp, the skins are graded. After having been softened with salt and naphthalene, they are then consigned in wet bags to Bulawayo en route to France. This little fellow's mother was killed by a local hunter, and the cubs were rescued by Robert Kay, founder of the Maremi Game Reserve. Tame and playful as a kitten, he can yet bowl over a grown man in an unexpected charge. Kept on a chain in camp, because of the leopard's dislike of dogs, the cub finds amusement in anything at hand. The day of our departure by boat arrives. Visits have been paid to the Paramount Chief, Lynchwe Latebi II, to the District Commissioner and the Chief of Police. We have had long endeavours with Mr. Wilmot about the inhabitants of the swamps. Under his guidance, we have planned our route through the swamps. The boats have been packed three in all, two 16-foot and one 12-foot aluminium craft with planing hulls. They are driven by a single 18-horsepower outboard engines. We must carry all the scientific equipment, food for two weeks, gifts for bushmen, tobacco, beads, salt, our large medical kit and eight people to each 16-foot boat. The 12-footer will serve mainly as supply boat. We are now a team of 20, including our African guides, interpreters, drivers, handymen, and cook. The boats must also carry petrol. Some of it has already been sent ahead in 44-gallon drums. These await us on islands along the route. We carry fresh food as well as tinned, onions, potatoes, oranges, and squash. We have a strenuous trip ahead and big appetites to satisfy. Because tinned meat is bulky and heavy, we have taken only a minimum reserve. Our travels will take us through one of the richest game areas in the world, and, we'll, and we will shoot for the pot. Our passenger boats are really crocodile hunting craft. The seat secured to a small raised platform in the bow normally does duty as observation and shooting post for the hunter, but we are glad to take turns at occupying this grand vantage point. Farewells are spoken. The boats start up, one by one. <laughs> the small supply boat leads the way. The others back from the jetty and make for open water. But here is someone who is in being left behind. He tries to follow us, but alas, cats aren't meant for water. The quest has begun. We follow the route Mr. Wilmot has planned for us. Departure from Matapaneng, passing south of Chief's Island, 
to the western bank and Sapupa, overland to Shikawi and back to Sapupa, into boats again and back to the swamps and north of Chief's Island to Matapaneng. Bill Corneal, our guide, prepares himself for the long journey ahead with all its potential dangers. Soon we see bird life in profusion. Here is a pelican sunning himself in a reed bed. He takes to the water, just a bit indignant at our intruding boats. We are travelling along a large channel at the edge of the swamps. Soon we will turn towards the interior. Desert scrub borders the water to our left. Soon this will be replaced by subtropical vegetation and palms when we reach the region of permanent water. In the lead boat Chobi, the team is already discussing the known facts about the River Bushman and the Okavango swamps. Savuti, travelling behind Chobi, has at present George Beaton in the hunter's chair. He is recording the ecology of the swamps with his camera. A saddleable stalk is sighted. Ben Grunewald in the hunter's chair of Chobi has Bill Corneal beside him. Ben is making notes for his actuality broadcast. The Okavango swamps, or more accurately the Okavango Delta, cover an area of about 7,000 square miles, a vast oasis in the Kalahari Desert. Summer mist and rainfall slowly fill the tributaries of the river high up in the highlands of Portuguese Angola. About six months later, and a thousand miles to the south, the water enters a vast depression in the northwestern province of Botswana in Gamiland. It spreads over the desert sand to form the Okavango swamps, a system of lagoons, creeks, flats, backwaters and islands. The environment is dramatically changed, and the only recognizable desert element is the sand the particles of which are so coarse that they do not remain in suspension, hence the crystal clear waters of the Okavango. There is no surface outlet, and the water slowly drains into the desert. In the swamps, desert scrub is replaced by tropical trees, some a hundred foot high on islands, studded by numerous species of palms. The islands are clothed with palatable grass and shrubs. Reeds, bulrushes, hippo and elephant grass grow in shallow water. The water harbours many kinds of fish, such as the palatable bream and the scavenger tigerfish. Vast herds of game roam the islands. Amongst all this beauty lurk hidden dangers, which have decimated the river bushmen. It is only since the conquest of malaria and sleeping sickness that the white man has recently penetrated this perilous paradise. A Bantu hunting parties mostly confined themselves to the fringe. A few penetrated more deeply to get meat and to return to the fringe once their boats had been filled. The maze of unnavigable channels had to be slowly charted. Systematic exploration of the swamps had to wait until 1950 when the Bechuan land government created two crocodile hunting concessions, one for the Okavango River and one for the swamps. Mr. Bob Wilmot, then an employee of the Francistown Mine, was on one of his periodic visits to Maun the small administrative capital of Vingamiland, on the edge of the swamps. He successfully applied for the swamp concession. In a single small boat, Mr. Wilmot soon got to know the backwaters and the islands with their inhabitants. He is today recognized as the authority on all aspects of life in the swamps. All early maps show an island, Rimunsanyani, in the middle of the swamps. Mr. Wilmot met the inhabitants of this island and found 30 yellow-skinned people with small faces and hands. They spoke a click language. That was about 10 years ago. And this is the group we are looking for. The boats now begin to pass through large reed beds. We must keep close together. The route is obscure and we may be separated easily. We travel through thick reeds. The propeller of the small boat is regularly cleared of clogging weed and grass. We press on. 
We have passed through the reed beds and are thankful to be in open water again. Palms become more plentiful. Bill Cornell tells us that we are half an hour from a small island where we are to spend our first night in the swamps. The frogs are beginning their nightly chorus when the boats turn towards a clump of trees and dry land. Boats are unloaded. To minimize the time spent on pitching and breaking camp, we have devised a set routine. Three areas are cleared. Mesquite nets are erected alongside one another and constitute the dormitory. Two circles around two fires, the kitchen and the lounge. All articles of clothing and instruments must be stacked well off the ground, out of reach of harmful insects. It has been an interesting, tiring day. Ten hours on the water. All relax around the fire. Graham closely examines crocodile hunter Bill's gun. We unbend. As Elias our cook prepares one of his bush banquets. Against the background of night noises, we listen to Bill's stories of adventures in the swamps. Sunrise in the swamps. And a city breakfast on a swamp island. Elias, our chef, has again excelled himself under the supervision of Dr. Cyril Thomas, our deputy leader. We have porridge, bacon and eggs, toast, jam and coffee. I suspect Dr. Wong may find a scalpel more useful than his knife. The inner man satisfied, we pack our boats. Today we have some 80 more miles to cover. We pass through country peppered with palm covered islands. The water is warm and so is the day and we travel with our shirts off. Clumps of soda palms begin to appear. The reed bed we are approaching is too dense to allow the boat's direct passage and we seek paths made by hippo from one lagoon to the next. We soon find one. Here we negotiate it. Visibility is restricted. We are now on the alert for hippo. Should we encounter a cow with her calf, we would certainly be attacked.
bill tells us that some of Mr. Wilmot's transport boats have been sunk after one crunching bite of an R8 hippo. One thing consoles us, the knowledge that hippo mostly forage and move around at night when they travel from open water along the hippo paths to graze an island. We actually hear hippo grunting and blowing not far from us. We reach open water again with some relief. The boats pass through flats of shallow water with hippograss. Many clumps of trees around us signify islands under water. We have no channel to guide us. But our guides have their landmarks and they know the way. Piloting the boats in this part of the swamps requires great skill. But every now and again, in spite of all precautions, the propeller is fouled the engine must be stopped and the screw cleared of clogging water grass or weed. A bull is now on the lookout for possible attack by buffalo, wounded by a shot from Bantu Hunter's gun. Such buffalo seek shallow water and hide in thickets from which they charge the next camera in a surprise attack. Our guides understandably give all thickets a wide berth. We have reached the maze of papyrus channels. Here hippo are said to be more numerous. We are however safe, so long as we travel in mid-channel. Travelling becomes monotonous. All we see is papyrus and still more papyrus. These channels are up to 50 feet deep, and because hippo are all around, Bill Cornell in Chobe takes the lead. Soon the channels open into lakes like this, before the reeds close in again with clumps of tall tara palm dominating the skyline. The water is crystal clear and plants growing on the channel floor a 30 feet below the surface can be clearly seen undulating in the current. These frames were taken with a telephoto lens. Gui is the name of the island we are landing on. Bob Wilmot's base camp is 160 watery miles away. We are to stay on Gui for two days. The outboard engines must be serviced, and our dwindling beef supply must be replenished with venison. All members of the team remain in the boats, while the island is checked by Bill Cornell and our trackers for wounded animals or lions. Our camp on Gui lies under huge trees, covering us like the groin roof of a great cathedral. It is near sunset. Mosquito nets are hastily erected. Our jobs are done. Roast potatoes for our first venison steaks. Town, our handyman, has been complaining of severe toothache. Our dentists, Dr. Cyril Thomas and Clive Chapel, assess the problem. Town has advanced carries of a premolar. Only the roots remain. They decide on extraction.
Yes. Tan is overjoyed at the painless extraction. At last, our hunting boat returns. Coming in fast and high out of the water, it looks as if our hunters may be empty-handed. But we will have our steaks tonight. Here is venison all ready for the frying pan. Our guides will be eating their first meat of the trip. But here is someone that also wants a bit. We should hear lions tonight. All our earlier stir this morning for Bull Corneal had gone crocodile hunting last night and had shot a monster. Three members of the team had gone with him, for we all wanted to know the world that the river bushmen live in. Ben, who overslept after recording the overnight adventure, tries to unravel himself from his sleeping bag as he wakes to the calls of the guides sharpening their knives for the skinning. Everyone crowds around to see what the belly of the crocodile will, will reveal after the skin has been removed. This must be done before the day warms up, or the skin may get too dry. The team makes anatomical comments, while the dentists take samples of the teeth. This crocodile weighs all of 800 pounds. The skinning proceeds, and soon the big moment arrives. The stomach is opened. Fingers are held to noses as Bill extracts the contents. the hindquarters of a lechwe cow and her calf. A complete vivid monkey. How swiftly the croc must have struck. More remains of a lechwe and the hooves of a zebra. The skin measured six foot across the belly. How useful to have a woman in the team. And how refreshing and inviting the water looks. And the day is warm. any crocs around? Fiona laughs at our teasing. We men, however, neglect no precautions for her protection. A boat is moored in midstream to warn bathers, fair and otherwise, of any crocs approach. Watch those beautiful bare backs. This titsy fly is certainly doing so. From its favorite palm leaf perch, it lands with dive bomber speed and undetected on the bare back of Clive Chapel, appropriately our entomologist. He soon feels the effect of its bite, but as a sacrifice to science, allows it to feed on. This fly may well be the intermediate host of the dreaded parasite that causes sleeping sickness, 
but Clive takes the risk conveyed by one tsetse fly in a thousand in the interests of science. Watch the fly's abdomen expand and redden as it sucks the blood of its human host. It can draw off as much as one cubic centimetre of blood at a single session. No wonder this painful little bloodsucker can cause not only sleeping sickness, but a serious anemia from its persistent attentions and siphoning of human or animal blood. Today was understandably infrequent. The Okavango is a fisherman's dream of paradise. Any kind of bait soon attracts the fish. In the clear water, you can see them take it. These are bream. A crab intrudes. As Dr. Wong takes time off from his clinics to catch and demonstrate a tiger fish. See those jaws, those razor teeth. Luckily for man, these fish have no interest in humans, unlike the piranha fish of the Amazon. We now travel to a nearby island for more fresh meat, which we can dry and carry with us in our boats. Warthog are numerous. The hunt gives us a good chance of seeing the game on the island. A giraffe is sighted camouflaged against tall trees. A warthog. Croc hunter Henry McIntyre stalks closer, a single shot. In thick grass, we search for the dun-coloured carcass. Henry finds it. And the trackers move in to singe off the skin and cut up the meat. we head for the boat. The meat is cut into strips to store it as biltong. These ever hungry watchers wait for the scraps. Nothing shall be wasted. A biltong hangs out to dry. On the water again, Bill tells us that tonight we camp on the island Koshira. We will then search the backwaters for the members of Bushman Pelo's group, probably out collecting nuts of the marula tree. The island is our objective, but many obstacles still lie ahead, and we wonder if we shall ever get there. Papyrus grass surrounds us. The channels narrow, the reed beds thicken and encroach. Suddenly, around a bend, we strike the first of several blockages. Our boats must be manhandled over this mass. A few minutes earlier, we disturbed a large crocodile, but now there is no time to think of crocs. The obstruction must be overcome.
we succeed at last. There is time to relax again and to enjoy the wide and sweeping view. enter shallow weed clog water and have to climb out and push the boats. Thoughts of cold beers tonight sustain us. As we push, we reflect upon our chances of finding the Yellow River Bushman. A German signer working in Southwest Africa was the first white man to describe River Bushman and he labelled them Bastard Bushman. Hurwitz, Almeida, Shapiro, Balsan, Wyndham, Jenkins and Bletcher all studied river bushmen who showed Bantu influence and admixture. No yellow bushmen had been described. Mr. Wilmot says that all early maps of the swamps show a village Rumunsanyani in the middle of the swamps. He met its people. They were yellow with small faces and hands and they spoke a click language. These are the bushmen we are looking for. The water deepens and the lighter supply boat floats first. The cameraman thankfully hitches a lift. Town demonstrates clearly the negroid facial features, the dark skin, the matted hair, the thick lips, the rounded face with heavy low cheeks. A tropical island greets us. It is Toshida. Our old friends, the vultures, are waiting for us. Tropical palms abound. This ivory palm displays a good crop of fruit. Camp is soon established on a small patch of dry land around a huge, untenanted termite nest. The vulture waits. On a nearby island, large dark shapes are visible. These are soon identified as members of a large herd of buffalo. We wish to photograph them. Bull leads the way. Suddenly, we come across two huge bulls on the periphery of the herd. Luckily, we are downwind. Bull stalks closer. The buffalo sense intruders. Most of us climb trees for safety. One buffalo has been wounded. It hides in a thicket, set on ambushing its enemy. tries to charge. Bill fires the final shot. Meat for the rest of the trip is now assured. We will definitely hear a lion tonight.
Sunrise of the fourth day on the island. Like an alarm clock, the shrill call of the fish eagle awakens us to a new day. A lechwe, a water-loving antelope, slightly bigger than the impala, and now almost exclusively found in the Okavango, wanders through thick grass towards water. Four days we have waited in frustration for a guide. Stabushwa, a river bushman hybrid, arrived last night. He will be our guide. Today we search the backwaters for the yellow bushman group of Ramunsanyani, under the headmanship of Pelo. The advance team has an early breakfast. We study our detailed aerial map with the maze of channels marked on it. Here is our camp. And this is the route we have come. We hope to find the river Bushman in this area, a watery region of about 900 square miles. The boats are light and we travel fast. We pass through lakes and soon enter a large papyrus lined channel. We seek a gap in the dense wall of papyrus. Our guide spies an opening. This is the entrance to a hippo path which leads through open flats to islands in the distance. From flattened water lily leaves and other grass, Stabushwa finds evidence that dugouts have passed this way, towards an island that offers a good supply of marula nuts. We make for the island, hoping to find the bushmen and camp there. It is a large island with many palms. Lion spur just two hours old and as large as a man's outstretched hand. Elias goes ashore to check the island while we wait for the all clear. Waterbuck and Impala are on the alert for they have heard our boat's engine. Tetabi, antelopes of the plains, still wander in large herds through the swamps. In South Africa, they are all but extinct, except in the Kruger National Park.
Impala, unaccustomed here to man, wander restlessly and uneasily. A brace of comical warthog cut off, tails well aloft. Elias tells us that all is well. The lion must have moved off to the far side of the island. We all wade ashore. Elias finds the remains of the Bushman camp, a still smouldering fire, fresh pumpkin peels, New cut grass are laid out for bedding. They slept here last night. The search must go on. Six hours and many miles later, we find ourselves travelling due north. We disturb a pelican. The stream narrows and islands loom ahead. We enter another narrow hippo path. A vultures circling overhead suggest the presence of man or of lion at a kill. Our time is running out. The island ahead is the last we can investigate today. Thick grass and narrow hippo paths impede our progress. We get up and haul the boats along, crocodiles or no crocodiles. We follow the flight of the vultures and mark their landing perches. A marula tree, a pile of marula nuts, and under a large tree are bushmen. Yellow River Bushmen, five in all. This old man called Sasa, his niece. Her sister and Sasa's wife and his daughter, these five have attached themselves to a hybrid group of relatives under the headmanship of Pello. Here is Pello's sister, a hybrid. The team soon gets down to work. We must record their facial features in both photographs and face masks. On our coloured hunter Henry, we demonstrate how a face mask is made. The hybrid children willingly show their teeth to our dentists in return for sweets. Meanwhile, we have convinced the bushman that the white sand is nutty for the skin. Sasa submits himself to the ordeal. Draws in his nostrils ensure easy breathing while the mask is made. Unfortunately, despite liberal application of Vaseline, the plaster adheres to Sasa's beard, 
and little sacrifice. A warm shirt consoles him for his loss. George Beaton takes us our fingerprints. Dr. Thomas examines Sasha's teeth. Body measurements are taken. This is Sasha with his wife, Siditsi. And Sasha with his daughter. And so we leave the five river bushmen with their darker relatives on this nameless island in the heart of the Okavango. Having found the Pelos group, we now proceed to the Okavango River and Sapupa. Here we transfer to vehicles for a five-hour overland journey to Shikawi or New Mohembo. This is a small settlement on the river bank. Here, South Africa recruits workers for its mines. Local stores do a brisk trade with bushmen who come from far and wide to barter skins for store goods. We had been told that three river bush groups were in Shikawi, the Mabukakwe, the Magamai, and the Matanikwe. These are black river bushmen. Here they are grouped in a circle with two desert kung bushmen. Here is a desert kung bushman speaking. Here are three groups. The couple on the left are Magamai river bushmen. The two in the middle are Mabukakwe river bushmen. On the right are kung desert bushmen. The Mogamai male has a dark skin, matted hair, and rounded heavy facial features. His wife displays some bush features. The Mabugakwe also show independent negroid features. The Kung Bushmen are typical of their group, light-skinned with peppercorn hair and flat nasal bridges. Here is another group of Mabukakwe, a very tall couple and a short one. The tall male is a pure Bantu. His wife, the nice ladies female in the group, has some resemblances to Sasa's woman folk. The shorter male is a hybrid. The shorter Mabukakwe with matted hair, dark skin and thick lips. His wife shows features of the desert bushman clearly, the childlike face and flat nasal bridge. Her child shows the prominences of the skull that bushmen retain into adult life. Here is a typical Bantu male, tall with sloping forehead, matted hair with thick lips. His wife is tall with a yellow skin, peppercorn hair and narrow lips the only one of her sort in the tribal group. A side view of the Bantu male. Here are the Kwai River Mabugakwe, also a hybrid group. The females shown all have some bush features in their faces. Patients come by dugout for treatment from the foreign white doctors. 
the clinics have become so big that all members of a team must lend a hand. Every patient must be examined and treated. Thus we establish goodwill. Here Dr. von Hoogstraten examines all the males. This patient gives a history suggestive of pulmonary tuberculosis. These large clinics soon deplete our limited medical supplies. Dr. Wong dispenses medicine to his patients. These men have had penicillin injections and must wait to exclude allergies. Burns, a common injury. A child receives treatment for diarrhea. Dr. Wong soon becomes popular with the children. And so, having studied the Black River Bushmen, we return by truck to our boat. Our return journey through the swamps passes through a region north of Chief's Island and back to Matapaneng. After the dry dust of the Kalahari, we enjoy the clear waters of the Okavango again. At this point, the Great Okavango begins to break up into the numerous channels of the swamp. We visit the only bush group living on islands in the depths of the northern swamp. All that they retain of their bush identity is the name by which they call themselves, Makanikwe, Bantu culture and their admixture are clearly evident. Their sleek dugouts contrast dramatically with our boat. This group is also collecting marula nuts. Here, one of the women is chipping open the nuts. Sidumetsi has a Bantu wife. After 23 days in the swamps, we sight our base camp once more. Mr. Wilmot is on the duty to greet us and is pleased at our safe return.
the boats that served us so well lie peacefully moored at their home jetty. These swamp grown beards will soon disappear. Reluctantly, we say goodbye to the Okavango. The artificial gurgle of water and silent animals herald our return home. A skyline of palms is replaced by mine dumps with their headgear, monuments and skyscrapers. In the Vidvatafront University is the Raymond Dart Gallery of African Faces. Here are masks of desert bushmen, of Bantu, and Hottentot, who closely resemble the river bushmen in language and physique. Amongst these, Sasa, the last of the pure river bushmen, is immortalized. 